up, YouTube? What's going on, man? You know it's Hood Punch, your boy Hood Punch here. We're gonna today. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna pretend to be a you know a sophisticated, classy, bougie art curator, and we're gonna talk about the influential, the myth, the man, the legend, Henry the Toulouse Lautrec. And you know, ever as a young age, I think it was I was a natural born artist. As a young age, I always loved art, and I always like to have a good time too. And it's that's fitting having a good time and partying because, you know. Who started the club promoting scene? DJ Khaled? Nah. Latrec, baby. Back in the 1800s, France. The original, the OG club promoter. And so, yeah, let's let's get into this here. And, you know, today, guys, I got a, got a little slide for you guys. We're talking about... Uh, Mainly about his influence. We'll, we'll go over the, you know, the where was he born, his childhood, all that biography and whatnot. And so, yeah, so his biography, you know, go over some inter art, uh, interpretations of his work, biography, and we're going to have a good time. We're going to have a good time, people. All right, so, you know, without further ado, let's cue the music here. All right, we're back here, people. And so, uh, so yeah, talk about the trek here. So let's let's ride, people. Let's let's get let's get into this. All right. So yeah, we got the trek. And basically. The track, like we talked about, is the the original club promoter. You know, his magic, his his superpower, was you know convincing people not to take things so seriously. Have a good time. Have a nice glass of wine. Maybe talk. Maybe flirt with a pretty girl here. So yeah, the power and magic of Henry de Toulouse Le Trek. You know, he lived from 1864 to 1901, around his mid 30s, like 36. Unfortunately, you know, his health problems, we'll, and we'll discuss his health problems, basically, and you know, the founder of using art as marketing and advertisement. All right, all right let's do this. Now, who, who he was? Who was this guy? French painter, post-impressionism era in the late 1800s, second half of that. And what is what is his work really about? You know, he, do, he does a lot. He looks like steel lives. I mean, Maybe paint something about a little dog or a cat or, you know, some guy reading a newspaper at a park. But mainly, mainly his car or his work is about the, the pretty ladies. I, hey, he's a womanizer like, well, I'm trying to be a womanizer. I just, I just worshipped him. <laughs> but yeah, he was a, an admirer, a worshipper of the, uh, of the goddess they call a, a good looking girl. Nightclubs, bars, a doll cabarets, right? Nice way of saying strip clubs, you know, titty bars there. And uh, you know his uh, his most expensive expensive work, maybe his most famous, Le Blanchisseuse, or you know the cleaning lady, the laundress. You know was sold for a record breaking twenty two point four million dollars at at a, at the Christie's auction auction house. You know, according to the Wikipedia article I read there. And so the early child life and childhood, we're going to get into a, where he was born, a little bit of his backstory, and then, you know, really talk about his interpretations and what, what, his, what his work means to us today. But we still don't want to know who the guy is. And, uh, you know, born in Albi, France, 
on 24 November 1864, and and it's 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 weird because being born in late November would make him a Sagittarius, and these people are known for being extroverts, the life of the party, and may as coincidence or probably maybe it has something to do with why, or maybe he's just his parents are rich. That could also be it. I'm sure into that kind of thing. I don't know, maybe magic's real. Maybe. Maybe the stars aligned for him at the party. Had a bit of a tragic childhood, you know. When he was four, three or four years old, he his his brother was born, his younger brother was born, he just died tragically died a year later. And you know, like all superheroes, you know, they have uh, like all superheroes they have a rough childhood. Like all the heroes in history. And um his, his, after the death of his brother, his parents had divorced. He went to go live with his mother. And around the age of eight, his mother discovered his, his superpower, his talent for art, for drawing and painting. And uh, they hired him a tutor. And his tutor would take him out horseback riding, you know, would spoil this kid. You know how rich people are. And, uh, and I guess that must have stuck with him because his, his, he has tons of, of still lifes and paintings about horses and that's just, you know, we, we cling to our childhood as much people don't want to admit it. Like our childhood and the way we were brought up is highly influential on who we become later on in life. Now, you can escape your childhood, but it's, 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 it's incredibly difficult to do so. Your childhood is very powerful, and we, we see that spoken, referenced later on in his life, you know, with this obsession with the drawing horses there. Go say anybody, you know, my mother... Um, my mother as well, she, she grew up a rich girl. I guess that's rich people. That was a bougie, bougie thing. I got bougie in my blood, I guess. So my mom, you know, she has also this obsession with... See, that's how you know you made it in life. When, when you get to have horses. When you're into the equestrian arts, that's, that's when you know you, you hit the bougie level. And she'll just discuss his per legacy and his personal life. Um, so during his 10-year career... Ten-year career is it really ten years? Well, according to Michael Hep Hilburn and this, um, according to Ma to Cor Michael and the Hilburn article, which I'll talk about, it, according to him, it was ten years. But probably guys, till the day he died, probably doing his whole life. But throughout his career, anyway, two advents, two major advances were were introduced into the 1800s, Paris, France, and that's one printmaking. You know, being able to like make highly detailed carvings and drawings into a stone and you're able to reproduce that make posters right so you make these high quality artworks and you just slap them slap them slap them everywhere and posting which it it's funny how again like the the zeitgeist of your of the sort of spirit of the of the culture that you live in and the spirit of the times that you live in kind of really does shape the art that you make, so it's it's fitting that you know the printmaking's going on. The industrial revolution, people aren't starving to death; they got money to spend. They want to party, they want to have a good time. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and uh, yeah, it is. So it's fitting. It's fitting that, of course, his work will reflect that. And so you could took lithography, you know, to a new level, made it highly detailed. It wasn't just these simple little uh, carvings or just these simple little outlines you know it would know it was these really vivid uh, scenes of uh, of he, he loved going out performances to go to, to concerts and so he, some of his uh, lithographs his prints should have them up on some but you know a girl mid pirouette or a girl you know flailing her arms open you know bursting out in, in, in song and you could just he just he captured it and so that was another thing. During that time, also, photography was just beginning to to be invented. And so, you know, artists would, they would no longer have to have somebody just stand there, like back in the medieval ages. You know, boom, they can just have somebody just in, the, in their natural moment, talking, maybe dropping a beer, maybe some guy getting punched, and just capture that moment, and then they can reference that. And so they could 
really make these photorealistic or just really capture the, the essence of a, of a scene of a moment. And basically lithographs are just they're just stamps made out of stone, you know, to ink an image, just what we're talking about here, when we say print. So many speculate because of his parents being blood related, they were, they were first cousins that got married, that that's that's probably what a lot of had to do with the Latrec's health issues. And unfortunately, during his teenage years, there was an accident where he fractured his femur, and uh, his legs ceased to his ceased to grow, and so he, it would it would uh, be very painful for him to walk, and it gave him a weird it was a weird look because his upper body had adult would continue to grow in normal proportions, but it wasn't that he was short; as he looked tall from looked tall, but from down from down under the from the hips down, he had a short, stubby legs, and so this probably has why he, his work wasn't so romantic, wasn't so idealistic. That's probably why he had this attachment with people on the fringes of society, the prostitutes, ladies of the night, the vagabonds, the alcoholics, the, the party people, the, the bohemians, the hippies of his era. That's probably why he had such an attachment, why we would... Um, you to do a lot of paintings and work on that. And probably why he had he, that his the people that knew him and then interviewed him during the time. So he had this, this just really bitter, almost almost self hatred at times. Probably also has a lot to do with it. His his leg accident. To one of his um, you know. How do you, how do you could say his uh, friends with benefits? One of his besties here it was a lady, a lady of the night, nicknamed La Casca de Or, La Casca de Or, or the Golden Helmet. And you know she was an inspiration for one of his most favorite works called The Streetwalker. And I just get the sense that me and Latrell could have been the best of friends, man, because me and him are of kindred minds, kindred spirits. We love and adore and worship him. Can't stop thinking about it. It's probably why I still haven't finished my bachelor's. And so, yeah, his thirst for females, so great. He made an entire whole series of prints of, you know, of, of prints called the L series. Basically just, you know, scenes of spending your check at the local whorehouse. And, yeah, I mean, it's obvious that this guy, what this guy was about was a shameless party. I'm the same shameless party trust fund kid. And here's the thing, so as he, as he gained fame, and as he got better, he, he got notoriety for his work, you know, to illustrate famous performers of his day, I can just imagine club promoters, bar owners, strip club owners, people that owned a, a playhouse, a theater house or whatnot, a concert house, they were just like, hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, hey, Latrec. Let me get some work. Let me uh, promote my stuff, man. Make, make me some good. I, it's probably like a, just a paparazzi pestering of like for people to like, promote his club, do this, some little artwork, some posters. I mean, his his poster game was just amazing. And uh, one of his famous um, perf performers or people that one of his famous musicians and singers at the time was Yvette Gilbert. And she was very unique at the time because she you had she had a way of singing and then talk and then talk and sing at the same time, which I I I'm gonna butcher the French a du a du du I have no idea, and which means a speaker in French. And so yeah, you you just get the sense that this guy was just definitely a, a womanizer, or a party animal, and again he's probably just they they, they wouldn't leave the guy alone. The club promoters, strub owners, to you know, to promote his business and make art for their businesses. And he later, you know, he later became known for making, if making, this is this is what ha if me later became known if making. This is what happens when you write late at night, and you don't proof. This is what happens when you don't proof for your hair. So he became known for making exaggerations of a female of a female's physical features. So you know, girl had a long neck. A big nose. He would just he would just make it like a just Pinocchio sized nose, and so maybe that whole 
you know, caricature drawing at your state fair probably comes from him. His motifs, his themes, it's pretty obvious to you by now. It's the ladies. It's flirting, drinking, party. And I get it. They're awesome. And so, however, his stuff wasn't like just a triple X, you know, hardcore porn either. You know, he also, a lot of his works was females outside of that context, outside of that sexual context. And some of his most famous works, which depicted scenes of a prostitute's life outside of actual, outside of a sexual acts, you know, include one, the, the L series, one of his most popular print series. And you, you see here, we got a lady fixing her hair. I guess this lady's running a running a hot warm bath. You know, just the everyday, the mundane part of a female, and maybe the, the pretty females or the sexy females, I think. And yeah, so which brings me to the to the point. So sometimes I watch uh an adult actress but sometimes like I'll sit there and watch the interviews and this is how much I thirst for women so you know when people ask me why do you love the impressionism Edgar Degas you know Monet and the impressionism movement because it was it was about what people what us guys actually care about sex <laughs> <laughs> pretty girls you know and so, you know, yeah, yeah, another one of his famous works depicting women outside of, outside of the nasty time, you know, woman in the mirror, we got it over here. And, you know, the, Michael Cora puts it this way, you know, he's an art curator for the Metrop Metropolitan Museum of Art, and he has this to say about Lautrec's work. Lautrec? presents her neither as a moralizing symbol nor romantic heroism, heroine, but rather as a flesh and blood woman, as capable of joy or sadness as anyone. And I got that after the 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 Haynes Lautrec, I think it was this A and E biography dot com channel it's paragraph seven. It's a pretty pretty good article that I read. These two articles Michael Cora's and Claire Haynes article. And yeah, that's what I was trying to say, but it's just, you know, I'm not I'm not that articulate or bougie yet. I'm just beginning this um this journey of bougieism, sophistication. And so, you know, we're just um, you can go interpret it some works of his. And so we got one of his um one of his paintings here, The Ball. And you know, I see, you know, two females here just they're they're enjoying their time, you know, two girls hitting the club, you know. And it's just it depicts to see her face just says that you damn right I'm fine. Ooh, but it's like her this face that that grin just says that she's checking a guy out. Like oh it's telling telling this woman over here to the right, oh girl, he fine. You definitely add me on Tinder. Right swipe. And over here, she's over looking at this face over here. It's like she's staring at a hawk or something, like a hawk staring at her prey. And like, oh, I got the next nice guy. This guy better see if I can get this guy to buy me a drink. It's party time. And so, yeah, I mean, you could see how this guy was, you know, Latrec was, you know, the DJ Khaled of his time. And over here, you know, a little more chill piece here. We got Margot. Like, I assume that, you know, the little puppies, Margot. And you know, to me, it speaks of, like, those lazy Tuesdays, those lazy Wednesday afternoons, and you just, you don't want to go out, and you're just sitting there watching your favorite Japanese cartoon or favorite Bleach episode or something, um, or Game of Thrones or what have you, and you're just Netflix and chilling, and uh, you, know, what, you, you ever get the mo times when, you know, you're just, you're lonely, you're a little bored, and you're, you're desperate for interaction from humans, and you just settle for, you know, talking to your cat, like, or talking to your dog, like, like, like if your fucking cat cares about, you know, last week's episode of Game of Thrones or something, or, you know, is, uh, is Robert gonna ask Samantha out on episode four of your, what have you, romantic comedy series there? 
And over here we got my interpretations of a piece called a poster. You know, a poster they would slap outside the bars and and the ambassador Aristide Puant, Puant in his cabaret. And so what I think, I mean, his face says it all. His face says it all. Like he's got that. George Washington crossing the Delaware. I'm like, nothing can stop me. I'm going to get baited. I'm going to get fucked up. Turn, turn up. Turn down for what, dude? So what is, this is what this whole piece is. His, the way his, his chest is risen and out and pumped. You know, that arrogant look on his face. Like, he's just going to pop bottles and pop models, man. And that's one of his... Uh, the, this, he did, and this style is what you call that Art Nouveau, that modern art style. And over here, my interpretations of a piece called, you know, painting here, an impressionist painting, is a horse fighting his groom. Like we talked about earlier about photography, like how photography was also invented at that time. You see, you couldn't do, a medieval person couldn't do this. You know, you you had to have a photography, right? This guy's trying to tame his horse, and you know, click, click, that takes the photo. And then the artist uses that as a reference, captures the, the, the pure magic of that moment. To me, what I was, the way I interpret it, to me, what this means to me is that unbridled, pure youth. Not, not immaturity, per se. You could see it that way as a Peter Pan, but like this, this um, not innocent inner child, but this curious inner child that wants to learn, that wants to grow, that wants to run free. And he's not going to be tamed. He's not going to let people tell him what to do. And like, yes, hood puns is still controversial. You know, we're going a little more positive, but it's just he's fighting the... And you, you're gonna, I'm, you're gonna, I sound like a broken record, but he's fighting. He's fighting the biggest Satan, the biggest demon, the biggest Lucifer in this world called authority, obedience. And he's not going to go down without a fight. No, he's not going to just... You know, go on on still stupid ass horseback riding lessons for some, you know, for some dumbass cop couple that that want to go on a date. No, that's not what God put him on here to do. He wants to, he wants to fuck. He wants to fight. He wants to run. He wants to be free. Yeah, plus, we're still a little, still a little controversial. With this piece, I absolutely love it. I mean, it's it's really it captures that Hunger Games. This is the real Katniss. And so, yeah. Like I told you, you know, you, Wikipedia, you know, who doesn't read Wikipedia? So they get this biography. But these two articles I really loved. It, Michael, uh, Cora Michael and Claire Hain. Cora Michael with this um, Helburn article, the H Helburn Timeline of Art History. Brilliant guy. And so, check that article out. He, he really... Guy, guy knows what he's talking about. I'm only pretending to be bougie, but this guy really is a black belt bougie. And he, it's not just this boring like biography. He, he really captures the, the, the spirit of, of, of his work. And Clarence Hayes also a very good article. Biography.com. You know, just go on biography.com. Clarence, Clarence Haynes. And. Uh, Yes, where I got that little um, that that quote, that quote about you know how how Lautrec depicted the woman and how she could be depicted her in in a real flesh and blood moment. That's where I got that quote quote, quote from here. Over here, the Khan Academy, they have a free you have a little biography book. This is a pretty cool video too, instructional video at the Khan Academy. All right. And you know I'm probably late late into the game. I mean, probably you guys already know about wikiart.org, but wikiart.org, you guys want to binge on art, check that website out, man. It, and it's ha and it's it's so awesome because it has like you click the image to zoom into it, and you can also scroll through it, play a little slideshow. It's it's an awesome website. Yeah, and so. What's up, guys? What's up, man? What's up, guys? Fancy. Fancy. 
And so yeah, I mean, it's uh, basically my video about Calusa Trek, and you know, let me what it at, what it means to me. And so here at Hurt Punks, we still like to get a little philosophical, a little, a little metaphysical and controversial. What it, what his message means to me is, you know, the true answer to evil. How do you fight evil? You know, how do you how do you get over someone? They say that the best revenge is not a is not a cold dish. It's success. Success, sex, and excess. It's having a good time. That's what hurts. That's what really hurts your enemy. When they see you with a pretty girlfriend and wrapped around her arm, they see you eating shrimp cocktails and whatnot, popping bottles at the strip club, just like pfft. the forecast says that the rain rain it's raining green today. Look. Color, water has the color of green today, and that kind of thing. When they see you stunting, that's how, that's that's the most effective. When you just open up to the love, the pleasures, the wonders this life has to offer, and the uh, one of those wonders being a you know, pretty pretty lady, yeah, <laughs> pretty pretty little lady, still trying to, that is, the pretty ladies up here. Some of those, some of those wonders are probably. Right? And so that's that's the track. It's just this big middle finger to like bitterness, jealousy, and saltiness. Don't have a good time. Yeah. You know, just like Nietzsche, the, the philosopher. You know, if you go around trying to fight evil and fight dragons, and right all the wrongs and try to be this big hero, you're just gonna be bitter. You know, those that try to fight dragons are only just gonna become one. Don't. You know, Jesus Christ lived 2,000 years ago and saved the world and died for our sins. There's no reason, there's no reason for you to do it. Yeah, there's no reason for that. And the last thing this world needs is another martyr. This world needs is a healer. A party animal. A socialite. That's what... So let's see. You know, put, put the gun down. Put the knife down. Have a, have a good time. Having a good time, enjoying life, is I think the real message, the real, that was his real power and magic to disarm people with a good time. And I just, don't take it so seriously. Enjoy, enjoy the moments, enjoy a cup of wine, enjoy the presence of a pretty lady. You know, it's, it's good, it's good to work and work on your craft, but you know, you work to live. You don't live to work. That, that statement, I think, is how he lived his life. Play hard. Work hard and play play the hardest. So, it's one thing Lautrec is trying to teach you with his work. is that you work to live. You work to live. Never, ever, ever live to work. That's all I got for you today, YouTube. Yeah. Take care. Have a... Have a nice, have a nice Thursday. Get ready for that weekend. Get ready to go the trek this weekend. I hope you guys go the trek. You guys, you guys go the trek mode, hang the trek, and it's just this, you know, just live it up. Just be your own bougie, bougie in Paris, people, and uh, take care, YouTube. Au revoir.